This is the Kratom Science Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Gallagher, blog and social media writer for KratomScience.com. Your source for all things Kratom. Jacob Ringstad never liked opiates, but at 18 he was diagnosed with degenerative disc disease. At 19 he was injured in car accidents. This would lead to over a decade of managing chronic pain with opiates. Three years ago, Jacob decided to get sober for the sake of his daughter. Using Kratom and cannabis, Jacob has managed to stay clean and open his own CBD business. This is Jacob Ringstad, and this is his Kratom story. You had to have surgery on your hand. Yeah, I have a Dupontrin's disease in my hand. It's also called Viking's disease. It's a contracture in your finger. Um, they had to basically go in and correct it with surgery, and it's super painful, but I've been able to do it all without any opioids, which That's is awesome. great. When were you diagnosed with degenerative disc disease? I found out about that actually when I was 18 years old and I saw a chiropractor. He was the first one to notify me that I had a back of a, like a 40 or 50 year old man already. Wow. Um, so he told me that, you know, way early on. Um, and then I had a whole bunch of car accidents. Um, that, you know, added to the issues and, uh, you know, it just progressively got worse through the, throughout the years. And then the neuropathy, um, and drop foot started happening at the end of last year. So it's now at a very critical point that I, you know, maintain myself where I am because I don't got anything, anything to work with on my lower spine right now. That neuropathy that comes from the degenerative disc disease, right? Where yeah, it now? comes from the, the actual vertebrae um, pinching the nerve um, that goes all the way down. So it creates kind of a nerve block um, of sorts, you know, where where it's the whole front part of my leg and top part of my foot is numb. And then I can't even, I kind of have to kind of drag my foot a little bit. Um, but mm-hmm. it's, it's better. I, I keep, I'm, take, I'm able to take care of myself um, and, you know, stay ahead of it now. Um, so it's not as bad as it was, so uh, the, all these plants are helping tremendously. You said you were diagnosed at 18. Is that when you got your first uh, opiate prescription? I got my first opiate prescription after my first car accident, was, which was like 19. Okay. Um, they gave me Vicodin and Percocet, and I, I didn't even like them. You know, I yeah. hardly even used them back then. You know, I, I actually didn't really start taking them, um, you know, daily yeah. until I was like 25, 26. Um, and that's when the uh, the degenerative disc disease really started heart, started uh, becoming super painful. Um, yeah. So I had, I was using the Percocet. Um, yeah, I was using Percocets and Vicodins and, you know, I was, I was treating the daily pain, but it was, it was just kept on getting worse and worse. And then, you know, uh, the doctors were giving me more and more medications mm. to deal with the pain. Is that how you, um, like graduated to fentanyl? Yeah. Fentanyl was just, you know, it was kind of a, uh, it was out, it came out of the, the fact that, you know, the, during that time is when they started to, well, at the end of it is when they started to, dial back the pain meds and eventually they just told me that you know i was too young to be on the pain meds um uh so they they would just wean me off and essentially abandon me with no other options and i was and i was just like you know i need to get off these anyways um so i was getting them off the streets you know i i I was doing what a lot of people you know unfortunately you know feel like they have to do because they feel like they need these medications to deal with chronic pain when I don't think it's necessary. Did you have to get them? Was it just because your tolerance was that high or was it it, that at the point where they started under prescribing as a response to the opiate crisis? It was that. And it was was a little bit of bull. Um, Tolerance definitely, you know, it could easily get out of control. Um, so and then and then once you start messing around with any of those, you know, street street versions of stuff, you know, yeah. it's not a controlled substance. You know, 
know, yeah. the, each one of those pills has a different level of uh, um, um, fentanyl in it, you know, so it, they're, they're incredibly dangerous. And so you said you were on painkillers for about a, a decade. Um, did you ever, uh, do you ever OD on them or come close to it? I definitely came close to it. Yeah. I didn't ever uh, have to go to the hospital or anything, but I also, you know, was taking, uh, I was being prescribed Xanax, you know, the majority of the time that I was prescribed opiates as well. Yeah. So that, that, that has its own, you know, dangers. So what happens with Xanax is a benzodiazepine, is that right? Correct. Okay. So what what problems do those create besides addiction? Uh, they create memory loss. They cause uh, they cause me to be uh, sick a lot. Um, ever since I got off Xanax, I'm not. I haven't gotten sick once. Um, yeah. They they cause a plethora of uh, psychological issues. Uh, for anybody who has uh, anxiety, I believe um, I, it, it's not. It definitely didn't help anything in the long term. Um, it was always just a short term, you know, band aid that never really solved any problems. And it was it was like a slow form of torture to get off. It's about one of the worst drugs you can give to somebody who has anxiety, especially when you're when they end up taking it away. You know, I I used to have a uh, drinking problem. So when I got prescribed Xanax, I thought it was a miracle drug because most of the, the pharmaceuticals that I was prescribed gave me, had, gave me a whole lot of side effects. And I didn't have many side effects from Xanax. Um, it literally made it so I uh, didn't feel like I needed to socially drink or, you know, I could just do a lot of normal things. So I literally thought it was a miracle drug until the day came where they're like, you're first of all on over prescribed it. You know, and then second of all, we're going to start weaning you off to, to literally nothing um, and not give me any other options besides gabapentin. And I then eventually they didn't even, you know, want to prescribe me gabapentin either because gabapentin has all these other issues as well. You said you got off uh, painkillers three years ago, I think, uh, in your live. Um, yep. Is that when you uh, found out about Kratom? Yeah, I found out, found crazy about uh, two months after I got off painkillers. All I had was cannabis at first, and it was pretty rough, but then I came across uh, a guy named Mike Harris's YouTube video where he was essentially saying that um, you could treat opioid addiction with uh, Kratom, and I ran out to a local uh, uh, Kratom vendor, and picked up a few ounces and I mean it worked right away you know I started feeling normal and I didn't you know even I, I lost that you know that internal battle of even like having to think about it or um, you know worry about it you know I didn't have to fight with myself of, with uh, you know that daily struggle anymore which is such a relief and were you completely clean off of opiates when you started on the Kratom, or, or were you still going through withdrawals? No, I had been, I'd been off it for almost two months. Yeah, I'm, I'm always asking about, like, the process of how people, you know, transition, just so if somebody wants to listen and they're looking to try to get off, um, you know, opiates, they can maybe, you know, listen to somebody oh, yeah, else's no, story I, I, and apply I, I think that's very important because yeah. one thing that I think is a common mistake with Kratom is when people are coming off of very strong opiates um, and they don't go through any sort of detox and they just go straight from Kratom to, or from opiates to Kratom, um, they, they have, they'll have experienced a lot more of what they are trying to label Kratom withdrawal, but it's really like their body never detoxed all that crap to begin with. You know, so I feel like, you know, the fact that I had that, that, you know, almost two months to go through the, the detox process was very beneficial in the, in the sense that it helped my, um, speed up my recovery with the post-acute withdrawal symptoms. I, I, I think the Kratom helps, the yeah. Kratom helped me deal with the pause. I think the, the detox of not having, uh, any, uh, any opiates, for like the first month and a half was was very 
was I thought that that was very uh, beneficial too, just to the to the point that you know when I found kratom, I was I was so ready to be done with you know all that. So it was just like I I literally lost all my reasons to even use those those dangerous medications anymore because like it it filled that all those gaps and, and dealt with my chronic pain and helped with my depression and, you know, helped hit all those things that I needed and that, that I had to deal with, with the post-acute withdrawal. Yeah. And you said you had tried NA and AA and that, and abstinence actually didn't work for you because I imagine, cause you have chronic pain and you have to take something for it. Yeah, correct. I uh, found a bunch of Kratom groups on Facebook, um, you know, at, when I first came across, uh, after I first found Kratom on YouTube, then I started uh, looking at groups on Facebook, and then I was able to get a lot more information about dosing, about strains, about, you know, what works for different people, um, and, you know, and more than anything is I got a lot of community, and I got, uh, you know, support from from people who are in the exact same position as me. So it gave me a sense of belonging and community that I needed at that point in my life. You might you said you had a young daughter at the time and, and you lost a couple of friends and is that that's what made you decide to, you know, get off the opiates? Is that true? Yeah, I knew that you know, in order for me to be the dad I wanted to be, I wanted to be present, you know, and the opioids were making me not be able to be present with my kids and even if I was present um, I wasn't consciously present the way that they deserved, you know, so I wanted to, um, I, I had used cannabis to get off of heroin, uh, like basically three years before that, but I was in chronic pain. So I ended up back on the painkillers. Um, yeah. so it, it was, it was something I already knew that I, you know, I had already gotten over something that was, was a very, you know, a, a very serious problem. Um, with cannabis. So I was, I knew that it was possible, but the problem was, is my chronic pain was so much worse than it was three years before too. So, um, you know, all those drugs, they wreak havoc on our bodies and, and, and people with, uh, chronic pain, uh, it, it doesn't help. You know, you, you, you put your body through so much more than you would normally without these medications because they just numb you down, you know, and they make you do things that, or you do things when you're using them that you wouldn't, you know, and then you're, you're just adding to the problem. So when you don't have those medications, that pain is tenfold. That's another thing is you do things that you normally wouldn't. Uh, I just talked to Dr. Darshan Singh from uh, Malaysia um, uh, Monday night, and he's he did a study where it actually, with kratom consumers that are, um, also opiate addicts and heroin addicts, it actually increases their social functioning, he calls it. You know, so they're actually mm -hmm. engaging in risk behaviors l a lot less, you know, you know, they're even like, like with like prostitutes and HIV and just stuff like that. They're, they're working more and they're able to function along with society. Is, is that one of the differences Do you s you see between opiates and kratom it just makes you a more just a more normal person rather than well yeah, i i've had a i had a very uh you know i had a very uh interesting uh experience with this recent surgery because i had to use the opiates while i was in uh the hospital so having that amount of time away from the opiates then to have to be on them again and while I was in the hospital setting um I can tell you like I felt just groggy and gross um to I, I was telling my friend Misty uh, that you know it made me feel like when I was a kid and I and I had too much cough syrup you know it's not it's not a pleasant feeling you know and that's yeah that's why it really signaled to me that there that the, the main problem of my uh, addiction, you know, wasn't the opiates. Something changed in me along the way. Um, because when I first started using the opiates, I remember I could like when I, I could remember that feeling of when I was, um, you know, 18 and 19, getting that first script of painkillers. I didn't like it, and that's why I didn't use them. Like you know, I did. I didn't. 
there wasn't there, there was just that nasty feeling and that's what i don't get with kratom kratom doesn't get me high it makes me feel um normal you know i i feel i just i i have an absence of pain you know it's not it's not a painkiller you know i don't push myself to do things that that you know uh that i probably wouldn't otherwise you know it doesn't numb me down physically or mentally yeah, and you, you had a lot to say about the medical system, too, that, um, I mean, you've been at it through a lot, but, you know, it's like, they're, they're kind of, you said they're poisoning us with these drugs, and even, even, uh, the food system is, you know, we eat so much processed food, none of it's natural, and you even said you, you were abandoned by the medical system, um, what did you mean by that? Well, uh, essentially, the, the, I, I've, I felt abandoned by them with the way that they just dropped me with the, with, uh, the painkiller management, the pain management, yeah. you know, they, they didn't give me any option, other options. Um, they just essentially told me that, you know, this isn't an option anymore. And they did the same thing with the benzodiazepines. And if I wasn't the, um, the, the type of person that I am where I, I do research, you know, I'm a, I went to school to be a history teacher and, and research is something I learned how to do in college. And, and I essentially applied that to my life, um, you know, because I knew that, that cannabis works. So, so I, I, once I found about, I found out, uh, out about Kratom, I, you know, it was just another thing. And then I just, I've been constantly informing myself more and more about all these other different plants too, because Kratom's just, you know, it's, it's a tool, it's a wonderful tool, but it's just one of the many tools that, that we have to use to combat all these things. Yeah, and uh, so you have, you take CBD too, and how, how does, yeah. uh, how does that help you? CBD helps me with, uh, with literally about everything. It doesn't block my pain the way that, that Kratom does, but it helps me not have to use as much Kratom. Um, and, and more than anything, it helps with my anxiety. Uh, yeah. I, I, I use, I use CBD primarily for the anxiety benefits that I, I get from it. And you said you use cannabis as an exit strategy. Uh, what did you mean by that? I've used, I've used cannabis as an exit strategy from every dangerous thing I've gotten myself into. Um, you know, from um, I used it to stop drinking alcohol. I used it to stop using, uh, you know, literally everything. Uh, that's why I, it was the first thing that that I was able to use to get away from uh, heroin, and then that was the first thing that I had to get away from painkillers. You know, it's it's always been there to kind of be a uh, kind of a backup plan to. to save me and get me through some really dark times. And you call yourself the CBD whistleblower, so what's the idea behind that name? CBD whistleblower comes from uh, just the fact that I started my own company about a year and a half ago, and I was really jazzed about the farm bill getting passed, so when I went out and started really seeing what a lot of these companies were doing and seeing how a lot of it is just marketing strategies and gimmicks to get people to buy stuff, you know, and it's not really, you know, the, a lot of it's lacking the medicinal quality that I know exist in cannabis. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of isolates, um, even the distillates, you know, that they're, it's, it's going after just a few, one or a few different cannabinoids, you know, and they're not addressing the terpenes and the flavonoids and, you know, the essence of the cannabis plant that really give it magic, you know, and make it, make it, uh, what, what it is, is so special. You know, it's a very unique plant, unlike anything in this, in this entire world. People, animals, they all have endocannabinoid systems, and our endocannabinoid system regulates every other system in our body. So our nervous system, our digestive system, our skeletal system, it's all regulated by our endocannabinoid system and essentially uh, our all the hemp that we used to get through you know the various products from the we would consume you know we just don't get it anymore so we're all endocannabinoid deficient and that's why 
people respond so well to it. Do you have any problems or side effects with Kratom that come close anywhere near to the problems you have with the uh, prescription drugs? Not at all. I've been able to use less. Um, I, I mean, I, I used to have to use a tablespoon of Kratom um, like every three to four hours when I first started, and I did that for the first year and a half. Yeah. And now I take, take uh, one teaspoon um, every six to eight hours. Um, it, it's very, uh, you know, it, I've been only going backwards. You know, my tolerance hasn't been building up. But, you know, I also use a lot of different plants that help potentate the kratom, help it, uh, help it be stronger, last longer. Um, turmeric and black pepper has is, is been a, a huge factor in me being able to keep that dose down and keep it really effective as well. Yeah, that's great. And I always ask everybody this, but I know the answer already, but are opiate withdrawals anything like... Uh, the feeling you get when you don't have kratom for a couple of days. I I do not think so at all. Yeah. I actually uh, last um, November I had to go seven days without having kratom, and I didn't have one single withdrawal that was. It, I, I didn't have any withdrawal actually. Like I I was in a, I was slightly uh, discomfort and discomfort from pain, but it wasn't. There wasn't any withdrawal. Um, I, the only time I've ever felt like I've had anything like that is when I have, was using a lot of Kratom, when I was using more than a, uh, a tablespoon, you know? Yeah. And but when, when I'm able to keep that dose really low, I don't have any problems like that. And it's kind of amazing. You know, they try to compare it to opiates, but it's kind of amazing that I hear from a lot of people, especially when they are coming off a decade or more long opiate addiction, that they'll say, yeah, I had to lo use a lot in the beginning, but then I eventually used less. That is unlike alcohol or any opiates or any other drug of addiction because people usually say, well, yeah, the more the better, but some people say it's manageable so you could use less and less and still get the same effects and that's kind of like unlike anything else it's kind of amazing oh yeah i've always appreciated the self-regulating factor of kratom you know where like you you it, you're, it's really hard to even abuse it just because it makes you feel like crap if you take too much yeah you know like i i hated getting the wobbles and you know, the first few months that I used it, I gave myself the wobbles quite a bit because just that addict mentality kept on telling me, oh, if you feel good from this, you know, another another tablespoon will make you feel really good. Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I you know, I, I learned the list, my lesson the hard way, you know, but, you know, I, I appreciated the hell out of it. It was amazing. It's amazing that it has that in it. And I think that's the reason that people are able to dial it back to. As you get time away from your quit date, and your body is able to, you know, heal and start getting, adjusting to get back to the way it should have been in the first place, you don't need that much. That's when I start, started finding the right CBD, I was able to dial back to create a more because I feel like my endocannabinoid system was, you know, working efficiently enough that now my body and that Kratom didn't need, I didn't need as much of it to get the relief that I needed. And in fact, I would, I had to just lower my dose because I was getting the wobbles um, from my regular dose, um, you know, just because I had the right CBE added to it. Yeah, it seems like with a lot of these things, with these more natural things, it's it's just sort of a catalyst to get your body going uh, to its natural state of wanting to be healthy. That's what you were saying last night on live, that the body wants to heal itself and it wants to be healthy. And it's kind of like when you get up in the morning and you want to do some exercise, but you're a little tired, but you have a cup of coffee and that gets you up to do exercise. Do you see Kratom and cannabis like that? Yeah, I, I use uh, I use Kratom uh, before I do yoga every morning to help me actually, you know, push through some of those stretches. Uh, I think yeah. the main thing that people with chronic pain can do is keep themselves moving as much as possible. Pain, when you, when you stay still, that's when pain starts piling up. And, you know, it's hard to go the other way. Um, so the more you can keep on moving, the, the, 
lower you can keep that pain, you know, it's, it's essential to just life in general. You know, our, our bodies like to move. Our, we, we like to get out and do things, you know. It's, it's good for our physical and mental health. Yeah, yeah. And how do you make Kratom? Do you just do a toss and wash? Yep, I do a toss and wash. Okay. I, I used to make a drink and stuff in the first year and a half, but I pretty much traumatized myself. So now I can't even smell <laughs> wet Kratom without gagging. So, yeah, I just do a quick toss and wash. Yeah. And do you have, like, preferred strains or, like, what? Yeah, I only, I only really do uh, greens and reds. Um, yeah. And mostly just... Uh, like I'll do the the darker red, like uh, um, red Bali and stuff at nighttime um, because those will make me feel more sedated. Um, but I, I tend to just stick to straight greens these days during the day. They last longer, um, and they're, uh, they they help me just as much with the pain than any red, and then I don't get the sedation. Have you ever had a doctor that you could talk to about? Your use of kratom or CBD? Yeah, yeah. I, That's I, good. My, I've talked to my last two primary care doctors about it, and I, they've all been supportive of, of it. Um, I think that you know, I live in Colorado, so yeah. the, the the medical community, as they don't understand cannabis, and they definitely, I I can tell you, both of them had never heard of kratom. Yeah. Um, they're much more open to it just for this fact that they're happy that you're not going in there and asking them for opioids. You know? So that's, that's not something they want to deal with anymore. Yeah, yeah. And having said that, though, it, Kratom is actually illegal in the city of Denver. Um, do, do you is, is that a problem for you, being in Denver? Not at all. Not okay. at all. There are... It, it is technically illegal, but the way they get around it is they they throw on. I mean, you can get kratom at head shops here. Um, it they just put a not for human consumption sticker on it. Oh, okay. Uh, that's how they get they get around that. But so yeah, I've got that for a very long time. They're like, oh, you're in Denver, it's, it's illegal. And I'm like, no, like they figured out how to get around that. Um, yeah, I have never gotten hassled once for it. I've driven around with it i drive around with it in my car every day um yeah you know i it, it's not something i've ever worried about are there any like uh efforts to legal just make it fully legal in denver you know i haven't really heard anybody uh talking about it uh yeah I, it's not really it's something i that i've been talking with, with some of my friends just because i think it would be a, a really you know great move to um you know show you know a positive motion for the kratom uh just just kratom in general in this country the more more of these ban reversals we can get the better yeah definitely and are you involved in a lot of like the aka type stuff or um i i'm going to be volunteering with the aka uh i, okay. I definitely uh, want to do that i've i've been active in reaching out to my uh, representatives and informing them. I've gone down and talked to, uh, you know, given given them the AKA handouts and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so I've been doing that for a couple years now. It's something I knew that I wanted to do um, purely out of the sense that, you know, I didn't have uh, money to donate to the AKA, but I have testimony and I have time. And, yeah. And uh, you know those those things I I believe are more valuable than money in itself. And it, and it's another thing where a lot of people are looking for community when they come out of addiction. They might you know, addiction is kind of a lonely place sometimes. No matter what you're addicted to, and it's great that we have this kratom. We have like a actual community, and there's like a purpose. And a, do you find that as well? Oh, for sure. I yeah, mean, that's yeah. why I created my own kratom group. I used to admin for some other. Uh, Kratom groups, um, but I, I decided, you know, I, I didn't really like the way everybody else did it, and I wanted to create a positive environment that, you know, people felt comfortable in sharing stuff, but also learning that, you know, um, learning stuff without, you know, having these vendor, uh, you know, run groups that are just trying to push different strains on people and stuff. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I wanted to, you know, show people also, you know, 
the responsible way of using this stuff because when I first started using Kratom, there was many people that told me that, you know, it didn't matter how much I used, you know, whatever, whatever I needed was, was it, you know, but I think as any person who uses Kratom has to use Kratom every day, the lower you can keep your dose, the better, you know, the more, the more effective you, you're going to make that dose be like less is more with Kratom. And, and um, us as chronic pain people, we have to make sure that our, our plants are working as good as they can, you know, constantly because our pain doesn't ever let up. It's Kratom, CBD, and MJ is the name of the group. Um, anybody can find me on uh, Facebook too. I, and I can, you can uh, send me a PM and I can invite you. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm on Facebook doing a lot of stuff on there. I'm also on TikTok and Instagram at uh, hashtag CBD with the blower and TikTok at uh, CBD with the blower. Thank you, Jacob Ringstad. We'll have uh, links to all of Jacob's social media in the description. The music is Risey. The song is called Memories of Thailand. The Kratom Science Podcast is written and produced by me, Brian Gallagher, for KratomScience.com. Please like and subscribe and take care.